Hello, 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 everybody. Thank you for coming to join us for another great Money Monday. I know it's Tuesday, but, you know, some people were doing other things yesterday, so we're doing it tonight. I am Rosalind Brown of Your Wealth Guidance, where we help Black women create their financial independence map and identify the tools for success so you can live life on your own terms. Thank you for joining us and be sure to hit the subscribe and turn on notification button so you don't miss any future speakers. Today, we have a great powerhouse. You probably saw our last go round, but if you didn't, you missed a treat. So we have Christy Rutherford. Christy has secured women almost $10 million in raises since 2020. We ain't even done with 2022. So listen to the gems that she has and how she is accelerating the careers of women all over the United States. With over 20 years of leadership experience, Christy assists executive women with getting promoted through office politics and self-care. She's a Harvard Business School alumni, Christy is also a certified executive leadership coach from Georgetown University and has been featured in Forbes three times. She's an author and she's published five number one best-selling books on Amazon in only eight months. Christy is the 13th Black woman to achieve the rank of Commander Lieutenant Colonel Equivalent in the U.S. Coast Guard's 225-year history where the demographic of us is only 0.1%. And so I hope you all are ready. And because one of the things that if you weren't here last go round, we had someone in the group actually start working with Christy. And I think we interviewed her maybe four weeks ago. I can't remember the exact um, time period. But in that time, she was able to launch her own coaching business and her book. And last weekend, she had her book launch. There's possibility today for you to accelerate and change the entire projection of your career and of your future. And so I want to say thank you, Christy, for being here. And just tell us a little bit in terms of like, what are we not doing? What are the mistakes that women are making? They're like, I don't like what I'm doing. I want to make some more money. I'm tired. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the 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 challenge that women are having is what you just talked about. I don't like what I'm doing. I'm tired. Don't nobody want to be around somebody who aren't passionate about what they're doing and that they're tired. So, you know, a lot of times we're looking for jobs and we just have a pulse. We're bored. We got all these degrees and we walk in the door with no passion, but we have the experience. We have the education. We have all the things that need, um, or I would say in our minds, where we can do the job. And look, let, let's be clear, Rosalind. We ain't even applying for the right jobs. Let me back that up. So we're we, if we're going into a job where we have the full suite of everything that we need to be in that job, we're in the wrong job. We should be two levels up. Let's say that again. I, I, I feel like we missed that. We like, yeah. oh, this is what I'm qualified for. Let me go after this. Yeah, let me go after what I'm overqualified for. I have the full suite of everything that is required. I've checked all the boxes. And women, if there are 20 qualifications, women will make sure they have 30 before they apply. A man will be like this. I got that one. I'm going to go for it. And then they get it. Right? <laughs> and so if you have the job that you're applying for, that you have everything, and you're like, look, I, I am, I'm, I'm overqualified for this job. Why are you applying for a job that you're overqualified for? Why are you applying for a job where it's so easy for you to get it? It's like you're not even, you're just breathing on the job. And people don't want someone who's just coming in to just do a job. People want, companies want people with passion, not somebody with the pulse. Now, if you're not feeling passionate and you're like, okay, I'm in my current job today. I'm not passionate about it. How do you know when it's time to work where you are? Or get up and leave. I think sometimes we'd be like, listen, I'm done. If you're not passionate. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yeah. If you're not passionate for a job and you just want a job to get a check and you're wasting your precious time here, shame on you. You know, shame on you for choosing to live a life well beneath what you're qualified for to simply get a check. That's where we're at. That I don't know if I answered that question, but it was kind of like a <laughs> drop a bomb on it. Like it's it's 
it's time to go once you're bored. It's time to go once you can do this with your eyes closed. It's time to go once you become comfortable. It's time to go once you become complacent. It's time to leave the job and actually choose to live a life of passion and adventure and take risk and want to be greater other than just getting a job and, and you're dying solely at your desk every single day, wasting the best parts of your life for a job um, that's not making you happy anyway. So we're not giving ourselves permission to be happy. That's the problem. Now, now definitely, I think one of the bigger things when we're looking at in terms of women, especially we're like, I am invaluable because I know everything. I've been here the longest. They couldn't do this place. This whole place would crumble if I walked out. Now, yeah. how do you get your right. to say? Well, if the whole place will crumble, then that means that you are, how do I say this? You are so overqualified and overstuffed with unmonetized intellectual property that you are specifically choosing not to go put a price tag on it and you continue to complain about being complacent in a job that's not making you happy and and being the everything and the background to their foregrounds and not asking for your value how can how dare you complain that that's on them that's on you they don't have to pay you for it because you're dependable and they know you're going to show up and you have integrity and you're going to work three times as hard and you're going to answer their calls on saturday night at nine o'clock at night and you're going to answer the the email on sunday at six o'clock in the morning you're going to answer the email while you're in church you're not even going to get any peace and now you know, you're burning out and you're blaming the system for using you when you're actually allowing yourself to be used. Now, in those situations, somebody's looking and they're saying, OK, I, I am feeling this way. I am doing above and beyond. How do they transition? How do they transition that expectation of others and then say, pay me my work? I think it's really about owning your word. And then when you understand your value and when you look in the mirror and be like, I don't have to take this ish anymore, you go and start to look at other jobs where you're qualified, where people will treat you like you're celebrated or treat you like you're valuable as opposed to staying where you're being undervalued and overworked. Like, and this is a decision for us to be free. This is a decision for a woman to take control of her life and stop being controlled by other people and stop being controlled by circumstances and understand that she creates the circumstances. That's just a different mindset. That's a, that's a mindset shift. That's, it's not that hard, but it is. It's not that hard. The, the woman is holding all the cards. The woman who is the background to the foreground, the woman where she leaves, everything falls apart. And you use that as a reason for remaining loyal and remaining a hostage in a job as opposed to saying, if I leave, everything will fall apart. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go and I'm going to apply for three other jobs. And once I have those three offers, I'm going to walk in the office with my three offers and be like, if you want to keep me, um, pay me this. Does that make sense? You have to exceed these offers that I have. There are companies that want women on their team they want senior women in the c-suite but they don't want a senior bitter tired raggedy woman in the room they like to go and they pick one of their golf buddies now we were talking about that earlier too so before we went live we were talking about okay you know half the time you are kind of set up to fail so you're in this situation and they're like all right we tried a woman she ain't work out or you know we tried a black woman we did that five years ago. We're not doing it again. We just go pick the golf buddy. Now, when it comes to that, women should be out there playing golf. Women should be. Tell us a little bit about some of the things or the ways that we're missing out. So today we're going out probably getting five degrees, every certification under the sun. <laughs> I think uh, I think the, the number one way to get promoted and the number one way. Am I looking at you here or here? Tell me which way I'm looking. Here. Which the second one here or here here yes <laughs> okay wow did i hook that camera up <laughs> okay because I, I feel like i'm looking and then i'm like i'm not looking in the right thing so um relationships are the number one way to get promoted right like people promote who they know like and trust and a problem that women have is they know your worth they don't know you so I was talking to, to one of my clients the other day, and actually one of my clients two years ago, um, 
her boss said, I don't know you. But she started crying because she meets with him every month. And she was like, I can't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand why he said he doesn't know me. I said, he knows your work. He doesn't know you. So they use their monthly meeting as a time for them to go through her work product, but they never built a personal relationship. They never talked about kids and what she likes to do. And people love to give advice. Successful people love to talk about themselves. So I switched the meeting and was like, why don't you go into the meeting and start talking about, um, you know, what's some advice that one of your mentors gave you and who are your sponsors and, and what is how what are some of the things that you've done to be successful? What are your failures, right? So once she started to build that personal relationship, start talking about his kids, she got a kid. Where are you from? Where are your parents from? Tell me some advice. Tell me about the once she built that, she got promoted three months later. She had been trying to get a promotion for three years. But once she built the relationship with a decision maker, he now knows her. And then he got promoted or she got promoted. So relationships are the number one way to get a promotion. It's not your work. So women are working hard to be promoted but working hard makes them unpromotable women are getting all these degrees to be promoted but getting all these degrees and now you coming to work working three times as hard looking crazy and you're bitter and you're angry and you're waiting for them to say that you have value getting another degree makes you unpromotable when a janitor makes more money than you or the or the guy who got a certificate in typewriter makes more money than you because women are chasing the title they're not looking for the money Women are working hard to get the money, but they're not asking for the money. Women are working hard to show people that they have value, but they're not asking for their value. That's all on the woman. All. Now, I think that's a good point in terms of you're not asking. So it's when you get the job or when you're on the job, but which one makes the most sense? How long are you on a job? So you started last month. Do you say, I want more money this month or... When do well, you have that conversation? Well, you know, the thing about, like, I was talking to a woman one time and she was like, Christy, you know, they paid me a hundred thousand and I, excuse me. And I, I was like, yeah, I'll take a hundred. Um, and then I found out that the range was 125. And so she said, they only gave me one. They only gave me a hundred. I said, no, you took a hundred. <laughs> Had you gone into the conversation saying I want 150, y'all would negotiate it down to 135. They said, I want a hundred. Great. So you take it. And then you get mad and now you want to come back and get what you didn't ask for in the beginning, right? You got to give it at least six months after that to show your work product and then say, I have done this, 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 and this. I have saved you this much time. I've, I've you know, made this company this much re revenue and I want to get an increase, you know, of $50,000. Now that, I mean, I want a $50,000 increase today too, but... I mean, uh... <laughs> $50,000. If you ask for 15 or 10 and they know that you should be asking for 100 if if you have a, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you an example of a range. If if you saw a Mercedes S550 and they say you can pay me 85 or 125 which one are you going to pay? Of course, the 85. Even that's so, so that's the problem. That's the, <laughs> that's the range. Does that make sense? Now, if you saw a, a lobster for two dollars, and or you saw one for two hundred, what you gonna think about the two dollar one? That is too cheap. <laughs> something wrong with it. You know, there's something wrong with that. So we're taking these jobs where we're asking so far beneath our value, and wonder why we're not getting it is because you're not asking for what your value is. And you're like, there's something wrong with her. Does that make sense? And you're tired and you're crazy. Um, but if you don't ask for, if you ask for a $5,000, $10,000 raise, they know that you're asking out of fear and you're asking why you're fearful and you don't even know how to ask and you're afraid when you ask, they tell you no. It's because they know that your value is so much greater than what you're asking for. They just like, she just, 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 you know, um, reach for low hanging fruit and you're easily, um, denied what you don't even deserve because you deserve 10 times more than that. So. That's why a lot of women who ask for these measly raises when men come in and ask for 80, 85000 and they get it, and then a woman goes in and asks for 7000 and she don't get it, it's because they should, she should ask for eighty five or hundred. And if she didn't get it, she should pack her, pack her ish, right? She should start packing her ish, get another job first, and then move on to the next level and get the eighty five, the added eighty five on what she's not getting with that job because somebody will pay you. So did you another job first? Yeah. Don't be, don't be mad at work just packing your stuff up, just walking out. <laughs> that, that did not put a proper price tag on your value. 
So the 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 thing about women not putting a proper price tag on their value and then get mad at the people who are paying them what they ask for is absurd. Like you can't if you went into a Mercedes dealership and you got that S550 for eighty five thousand dollars and you knew, Rosalind, <laughs> you knew MSRP on an S550 is not eighty five thousand. It's one twenty five. Yeah. Get one in the parking lot and hope they don't call you and find out that the paperwork was wrong. Does that make sense? That's their problem. Exactly. That's their problem. They missed out. Exactly. That's on you. You like, and then they gonna call you a week later and be like, wait, hold up, we messed up. You'd be like, no, I signed the paperwork. This car is legally mine. It's the same thing at work. You took the 85 and you're like, wait, I, I think I should ask more. They're like, no, we gave you what you what you took. And we got the legal paperwork and they try to say that you signed to say, I will accept $85,000. That's on you. Don't be mad at them. We, we can't we do the exact same thing, Rosalind, and then get mad when people do it to us and become a victim. No, you did that. And that's because Vicky, Vicky actually said this is so true. She said she's leaning more into relationships with management. Um, so she says she did the pack mule thing and it didn't work. So definitely kind of changing the whole mindset of don't be the hardest worker with the most degrees. Yeah, what's a pack mule? <laughs> Just what's, like, a pack, what's a pack mule? The pack mule, the one that's you know, holding the pack, the one that's uh, holding everything as you go up the mountain. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the one that takes the weight off everybody else. So, oh. since, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Vicky, where are you from? Girl, you sound like you're from down south. South Carolina. Like. <laughs> South Carolina. That sounds like South Carolina stuff. <laughs> now, I know you're doing an event on Saturday. So your event on Saturday is going to be how to calculate your value. Because somebody is sitting here saying, I don't know if I'm underpaid or not. Or maybe they're like, listen, I, I make good money. But they don't know if they make like pass what is possible in terms of good money. Because um, maybe they're making more than they've ever made before. And they're making more than they mama made and 10 cousins and all of that. How do they know their worth? And so definitely, you know, tune in on Saturday. But give us a little tidbit in terms of. How do they know that they haven't actually gotten their full potential? If 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 you're not making a million dollars, that's one. <laughs> this is the thing, right? We got four sisters, seven figure packages in a pandemic, right? Uh, not the six. not not the not the six. Everybody be happy about seven. That's an extra comma. We're not, if you, I mean, we're not even shooting at a hundred thousand dollars. Shooting at a hundred thousand dollars is a new ten thousand dollars. You can't adequately have a house. Uh, uh, you can have a used car. If you're making less than a hundred thousand dollars, shame on you, right? If you got an MBA, I said I, I put a post up. Boy, the Saints came after me too. I put a post up that said, if you're making less than, if you making, if you got an MBA and you making less than a hundred thousand dollars a year, you ain't doing something right. Boy, they came for me. And then I'll be like this. If you, if you tell your friend you got an MBA, you make less than $100,000, she clap, that ain't your friend. Right? That's one. So $100,000 is a new $10,000. That's nothing. You can't even get a, a decent lifestyle of $100,000 if you got an MBA. Why, why go spend $200,000 in a degree and you're not even going to make $100,000? Um, I think that anybody who is, anybody over 40 should be making $225,000. Why not? You got 20 years of, of experience. You have 20 years of intellectual property. You have 20 years of something that you've been doing something, right? And that you have all of this experience and and, and we're walking around with, with our coffers and our, you know, with this gold mine of stuff right here and we're not putting a proper price tag on it. So how do you calculate your value and how is value calculated? There is no magic number. It's just like, what do you think about yourself? Right. There is no Kelly Blue Book value of of how do you determine what your value is? It's like, how much do you think you're worth? And that's the problem that we solve for. That's the that's the solve for, you know, A times B equals X. Right. Or, you know, I, I was not good at statistics, but that's the equation that we have to solve for is who told you that you weren't good enough? Who told you that you weren't going to be anybody? Who told you that you weren't going to make any money? Who told you that? You should be happy with just having a job. Who told you that 
you should be just be content with where you are right now. Does that make sense? Like we're fed these pack of lies, or you read the articles that say we're going to go into a pink recession when they're going to lose the most. We're going to go into, um, you know, COVID is black and brown women are going to lose the most. Black and brown women are going to lose this. Black and brown women are going to lose our ovaries. Black and brown women should expect to be, you know, get endometriosis and fibroids three times more than their white sister counterparts. Black women should expect not to make as just as much money as men do for the next 18 months. Black women make the least amount of money. Black women are the most educated, but at least paid. Black women are, I mean, like, we're reading all of this data and these statistics that tell us why we're going to lose it. You choose whether or not you're going to be a loser. Mm. That's good. You choose and whether or not you're going to believe what they say about you is true. It's not what people call you is what you answer to. It's not what people say is not possible possible for you is what you use to justify why you lose it. I don't know if I answered your question, so you got to ask that question again because I kind of went off the whole tangent. <laughs> but Jay Weezy says, say that, Christy, because I think we need to hear that because... Yeah. We are so limited in terms of our own sight or vision. Right. And um, I know we talked about this before we went live is sometimes we are saying, goodness, no one in my family has ever done this. So once I hit that point, so once I'm able to buy the nice car, I have made it, but they don't see further than that. And so really to get to the point where you may not know anybody who makes $200,000, you might be the first person who makes $200,000 and you're like, hmm. 200,000 isn't even that much. But go ahead on this. I'm sorry. But you don't know until you made it. And you'd be like, wait a minute. This ain't really, because 200,000 ain't really double $100,000 in take home pay. It's not that much. It, yeah. Not yeah. That much. You, can blow that, you can blow that fast too. Um, you can blow that just as fast. You can blow through $50,000 indeed. Um, but it's allowing people to see that. And, it, and especially, I mean, we touched on this too. And I thought this was a really good conversation that we had. We talked about the advanced degrees and what it's getting you. And so where should you be investing your time? So you spent two, three, four years trying to get your MBA when you could have been, you know, going to happy hour, playing that's golf. What, that's what you should be doing because that's all they're doing. Does that make sense? Like we're, 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 we're watching it modeled in front of us and get mad that it's not us when it can't be us. We can go to the Irish pubs. I went to the Irish pubs all the time. My friends didn't know that I didn't like Irish pubs until I got out. I was like, yo, no, I hate Irish pubs. Chris, you want to go to the Irish pub? H-E-L-L. No, I ain't never liked the Irish pubs. They was like, you used to know. I said, because I was there to be relationships, to get promoted. And I did, which is how I became the 13th black woman to make blah, 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 blah. You know, it's like, you know, sometimes we have to do what we don't like to do, but you have to build a genuine relationship and not just be there. If, if you want it, either you play the game of leadership or you be a player. Either you either you work it to, to move the chess pieces around on the chessboard or, you, or, you, or you're being moved, right? So if we're going to go and, and play on their chessboard, we have to be willing to play chess. And a lot of women aren't willing to play the game. A lot of women don't want to play the game and then they can play they're losing. Well, either you're playing the game and you're going to play to win and be strategic about the relationships that you build or you're just automatically going to opt out but you're, and when you opt out you're going to lose and you're not going to be paid and you're going to be abused and you're going to be overworked and you're going to be under, undervalued that's on you right like you're choosing to go on a chessboard and refuse to play chess and wonder why you get pushed around the board you you over there playing checkers tell me well, i want to play checkers but you're on a chessboard you're in corporate you're a professional woman. You're on the chessboard once you become a professional woman. If you want to go play checkers, work at McDonald's. <laughs> not McDonald's corporate because they make it $200,000 up there. No, I mean, not McDonald's corporate. America's <laughs> <laughs> worse for You know, it's, it's not that much deviation from what you're going to do and how you're going to make the fries. The fries take three minutes. They all have instructions. That's checkers. But once you graduate and enter the professional arena, you are automatically on the chessboard. And now you have to choose whether or not you're going to play chess or you're going to complain that you, you don't want to play chess and they should just play checkers. Well, you've elevated to the chessboard. So either you're going to play or you're going to play or you're going to opt out or you're going to lose. And don't be complaining about you losing in a game that you're not willing to play because you're on the board by default. And that really goes back to what we were talking about before. We were talking about this whole grind culture. And I don't know who in the heck started promoting, you know, grind all day, grind all night, no team, no sleep. I'm team, go to bed at 10 o'clock, maybe yeah. 9.30, depending on 
if you know how I'm feeling. And so I don't know who who promoted that, but I, I'm not that team. And so, so many of us are thinking, I got to be the hardest worker. I got to grind nonstop. I need eight side hustles, all those kind of things. And I know you talk about just being able to elevate yourself and your career through self-care as well. You're going to do that by, you know, team no sleep. Um, <laughs> but let's talk a little bit about that mistake that we make in terms of I, I'm the hardest worker. I'm team, you know, grind all the time, those kind of things. And then you're like, wait a minute, it ain't it ain't working. I work harder and I'm still not getting something. You know, it's interesting because I everything that I'm talking about, why I'm all I'm talking and women be like, I can't stand her because she don't know what she's talking about. She blah, blah, blah. she didn't work in corporate. We like, okay, great. Uh, I did it. <laughs> everything that y'all doing today and all y'all messing up, I did that already. So I'm back to share the mistakes of what not to do. So let's be clear. Chrissy Rutherford worked from 6 30 in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. I will be at 11 o'clock at 11 o'clock on a Friday night at my desk. Somebody telling it on me, calling and sending it on me. I'm talking about legit, like in hot water on Friday night at 11 o'clock when I was supposed to be at happy hour with my friends. Mm. So I work 80 hours a week and got mad at the men who only work 35 hours a week. And, and now I'm thinking about it like that was stupid. Why? How am I continuously trapped in a cycle where I'm working 80 hours a week because I'm going to produce the highest quality product available. Does that make sense? And I'm mm -hmm. volunteering for the diversity committee and the diversity that's and the, you know, and I'm, I'm the person leading the potlucks to come in on whatever, you know, affinity group <laughs> month it is. And then I'm mentoring 90 people and then I'm going above and beyond for the 160 people who work for me. And yeah, it makes me feel good because I need it and I'm valued and I'm valuable. And I feel like I'm, I am, um, you know, I am the spoke in the wheel that if I fall off the wheel, then the whole thing is going to fall apart. But if I die tomorrow, they're going to they roll me on out the office and they're going to put somebody in there. So this is the this is the thing that we create in our own minds that we're the people. We're the ones that, you know, run the show and nobody can run it without us. And that's a lie that we tell ourselves. That's not them. They work 35 hours a week. They go on to play the basketball game. They're every golf tournament. They gone. And we're at our desk, we're, we're burning out, we're crazy, our hair is falling out, we got high blood pressure, we got back aches, we got headaches, we're single, we're crazy, we're rubbing our own leg at night, we're bitter, we're tired, and, and we're blaming them. It's us, it's us, it's us, it's us, it's us, it's our mindset, it's the lie that we've been told, and it's a lie that we tell ourselves, it's us, it's not them. And once you realize that and you and you stop the vicious cycle that you created, you created the cycle. It's you. It's you. It's you. It's you. It's the lies that you tell yourself. And once you stop, this is what I teach my clients. Once you stop and you say no, they come over and ask you, well, do you want to do a project? You be like this. I ain't doing that. <laughs> no. My clients go like this. No. And they walk up. They be like, okay. And they will go out and say, don't, don't add, but no, I would love to, but I can't. No, I have tennis and then I got to go home and pick up my kid. No, like, no. Well, once you, once you make the decision that you're not going to do it anymore, it becomes easy. The problem is we're caught in this vicious cycle in this net that we can't get out of and we're dying, you know, literally and figuratively. We're dying at our desk, literally, strokes, heart attacks. Um, cancer and we're sick and we're miserable and you know we're disconnected um, with ourselves right uh, if you're single you're disconnected with your family uh, you're disconnected you know a lot of um, women are disconnected with their spouses and their kids because they they are just connected to their work all day and they're disconnected and so it's like at the end of the day what is it gonna take you to wake up it took me damn near dying right um, and burning out to a point where I couldn't create a coherent sentence for a year before I got this message, which is why I'm here. This is what I talk about. This is why I talk about it. This is why I'm passionate about it is because it took me damn near dying before I realized um, how I got it so wrong and, and, and who sold me that pack of ish and really Rosalind, I sold it to myself. I think that's huge because I think we are creating the vision of what we think because we think one plus one equals two when it don't. No, not corporate America. I mean, like if I get three degrees yeah. Yeah. for 12 hours equals promotion. Oh, that's a lie. 
And we like, wait, hold on. How did I, I got all the degrees? And I, I was definitely sharing. I worked with a lady and she came over. She said, hey, I got my MBA. I just graduated last weekend. And then she came and sat in the same seat doing the same job. I was like, girl, what? But she didn't ask. She was thinking that the degree would open the door as opposed to if she asked him before she, she could have asked and not got the degree and got the door open. I, I, one of my clients, um, I met her in a, in an MBA program. She was, she was making, you know, 85,000. And then we, I started working with her. She, I'm sorry, she was in it. She got an MBA and then I met her in an executive MBA. So she was going back to get a second one. I was like, if the first one didn't get you past that. Like, <laughs> she like, oh, right. but before <laughs> we even finished that, she was probably uh, a year in when we started working again. She doubled her salary just by the work that we did. Right, like it wasn't the degree that got her the double salary. Now she'll get the degree and she'll get more money. But all she had to do was ask. The first degree didn't open the door. Why are you going back to get a second? I I talked to a lady and I was like, I ain't got nothing for you. I was like, I don't know what you're going to do. She had a PhD and three master's degrees and and makes sixty five thousand dollars a year. I said, come on. She have paid more in education than she made in five years. Thousand dollars in loans. Right, you're never gonna pay them off, and and then talking about they against me. Oh, you know, I let her have it. She probably don't like me right now. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, if the first two masters degree didn't do it, you and they were like in chemistry and I mean like biology. So these ain't no you know early childhood education or easy things. These are like chemistry and biology degrees. Um, and she made sixty five thousand dollars a year and was, and was mad because they did her wrong. I was like. You did yourself wrong. Um, but, you know, I, I say all this and I, I almost feel like I'm being disrespectful. I probably should have had some coffee before we got on this phone. It is late. Uh, you know, my, my meter and my filter falls away at about five o'clock. I'm real political until about five. After that, y'all just get the wrong and cut, Christy. But, you know, I think Roz and me have really have to have the conversation about how we're contributing to our misery. You know, how, how we're contributing to being undervalued. We we have to stop blaming other people because when you think that other people are in control, then you think that you have no control. When you think that other people are in control of your circumstances and your destiny and the job that you're qualified for, then you then you take yourself out of the equation. You have the power. We're walking around like we have no power. We have all the power. We can't say that I have no power because I'm the person that everybody depends on as opposed to be like this. I am the SHIT because I'm the person that everybody depends on. Does that make sense? You'd be like, I have no power because, you know, I'm being worked and he needs me and she needs me and he needs me and I'm holding this whole building up as opposed to thinking that, wait, I am the person that he needs. I'm the person that she needs. I'm the person that he needs. I am the person that's holding this building up. It's the, it's the, it's the slight shift of if I am that person, and I'm not being valued. Either you're going to value me and, or I'm going to leave. But what I want to do first is I'm going to go and I'm going to clearly be able to articulate what value I bring to these people in this organization, to another organization who is looking for me. We can't be in the great resignation where the largest number of people who have left their jobs and there's still being no opportunities for women. Like, this is insane. How can we have no jobs available for women when we're like 2 million people left their jobs in February and like <laughs> 2 million left? I think probably like 6 million jobs have transferred in the past six months and women still don't have no opportunity? Come on, man. What paper are y'all reading? It's what we're telling ourselves. That's all the, that, 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 that limiting belief overall. It's what we're we're internalizing. Somebody said, you know, we see people, some some man out there, he hearing two million people left. So there's a five hundred thousand dollar job out there for him. And we like, but what if we and we focus on the maybe it's gonna be a recession? Yes, exactly. <laughs> like, I better keep the job. I better I'm not gonna lose my job. This is your job. This is my heart. Well, I'm holding on to my job. You be like. What? The job that hasn't has been abusing you, using you, abusing you, or underpaying you for five years, you're not going to hold tight. He's going to be like, my God, there are millions of jobs out here. I'm going to go apply for 30 of them. Does that make sense? This is insane. You know, um, we I interviewed uh, Rashida Dow 
maybe a year ago. Um, so go back and check out that video too. But she said something that stuck with me and I absolutely loved it. She said, if you hate your job today, why not take a risk? Because why do you think you can't find another job you hate? Like, if that's the bare bottom, if that's where you're going to fall, yeah, why, why in the world would you be scared? Like, that's... <laughs> <laughs> like we can't be you know here's the problem right like i think we're, we're talking around the issue the real issue is how we see ourselves that's the real problem the real issue is black women are freaking tired and exhausted and exasperated and don't even get me started on the media like all, i mean all the stuff that we go through and we don't see ourselves clearly, which is which is what the problem is. So the real work, Rosalind, isn't about the job. The real work begins with the woman. The real work begins with the conversation that we're having with ourselves and, and, and the narrative that we've created around this hell that we've created. And we don't think that we can get out of it. A lot of women are dying. You know, the real conversation is who says something to me when I was eight years old or who I was or when I was five years old and told me I wasn't going to be nobody and then I'm living out this self-fulfilled prophecy or somebody told me who I wasn't going to be or, you know, I have a, a couple of clients who were like teenage moms, but they were prodigies. Either they were a prodigy in their family or they were a smart kid in their family. They didn't mess around and became pregnant. Oh, yeah. So now, you know, you, you've worked for 30 freaking years because in your mind, I have to prove them wrong. Now you're 50 working 100 hours a week to prove people wrong. The baby is 30. Does that make sense? Like you've proven it time and time again. So a lot of times we have these old narratives in our minds, completely oblivious and unconscious of it. That's the problem and the equation that we solve for. Who said it? Who did it? What happened? So we can go back to that. And once we be able to solve, you know, that conversation and resolve that conversation, that's how, you know, we um, we got 13 women who got a 30 percent or more raise. Uh, I think it's 15 women over their salaries, non triple their salaries. And then four got seven figure packages. And and that happens typically within 90 days. Some may take a year. But in that year, other things need to be worked on. Like maybe they got to restore their marriage. Maybe they got to reconnect with their kids. Like, and then once they are the woman who can now handle additional levels of responsibility because they got what matters in order, they got their health in order, then God will God will unfold the rest of the stuff, right? So a, a lot of it is solving for why don't we why don't we think we're valuable? Not why don't I know my valuable? Why don't I think I'm valuable? That's the problem that we have. And I think that's, and I think that's just, just to just go back, back to what, what it is that is keeping you in that moment of I'm not worthy. And I don't think we're always thinking about, hmm, you know, where did this where did this mindset come from? Yeah. And so I know a lot of people will talk about I had a teacher who said I'll never amount to anything or. You know, you had somebody in the church that said you're a problem child or it's a parent or an aunt, an uncle, whatever that might be. Yeah. And just kind of locating that that moment in time that changed the trajectory of how you think about yourself. That's that's the work. That's that's exactly, you know, a part of the work that we do. And so, you know, um, one of my clients would chase you. She was so angry. Tell me she wasn't angry. Be like this. Her. She would, you say something to this chick at work, she would chase you down the hallway. Chase you. You hear me? Say something. Clap back on, <laughs> on, on a thousand. And so we had to get to why. I mean, chase you. <laughs> Cut you out, right? And it's because when she was younger, you know, like she just stick up for herself. That was the problem. So she's oblivious of why she's angry and get caught in a cycle, why she get promoted because she's so damn angry. And like you're, 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 you're you know, um, and it's because she didn't stick up for herself, you know, in two particular situations when she was younger. And that's the recording that's playing in her head. Like, oh, no, I'm going to let you have it because because when I was little, does that make sense? So now she you're all these situations and you're being considered a toxic employee. And, and you don't think that you're toxic because you think that they're doing you wrong because they're not paying you right and they're not treating you right and you've promoted 10 men over me is because you're like hostile 
and they can't trust you in additional levels of responsibility because you're looking for the clap back at all times. So you're the barrier to your promotion based on the actions that you're having. But once we start to have these conversations with our friends who support the narrative of they're doing us wrong, then, then you're stuck in this loop of I'm the victim as opposed to understanding how you're creating that cycle and then come out of it. Now, back to the point you bring up friends. Now, you talked about friends before. You know, your friends are like, oh, you make X $60,000. Yay, that's great. Um, in terms of where we are and as we repeat these cycles, and I know you did another um, talk, I think about a week ago, and talked about getting together with friends just to complain about life. So we're like, all right, Friday, let's get together. Let's drink. I hate my job. Why you hate them people this week? Karen, still get on your nerves. Tell me what you <laughs> And so that friend group is actually accelerating or yeah. per, uh, just keeping up that whole, I'm just bitter. I'm stuck in this place. Yeah. How do you uh, take an inventory of your circle and then figure out if they're helping or hurting? Well, you know, one, if you complain, then you're part of the problem. That's one. Right? Two, I think the, um, you know, me and my friends used to get together every Valentine's Day to talk about men, right? For three years in a row. I said, hold up, hold up. <laughs> we had bonefish grill eating the chocolate cake at the end, and you know, we got the same thing. I'm like, we're the same seat. I said, Hey, hold on, three oh, years around you. <laughs> we can't be telling it, can't just be them after three years. We, it has to be us. Does that make sense? <laughs> so, really, I think, Rosa, it's not necessarily about um, looking at which friend is wrong because then we're, we're now still pointing the finger at somebody else, like they're the problem. No, you're the problem. So once you make a decision that you don't want to live like that anymore, that you deserve a better life, then that takes courage. Because when I left my job, three and a half years left to retire with a full pension, crazy in the two left shoes, would have died within the year or had a stroke within the year. They talked about me like a dog, right? Like, because it's more normal for me to be on anti-anxiety medication. It would have been more normal for me to, you know, just fold or crack up or go crazy or have a stroke. That would have been more easily explainable than for me to walk away from my career with three and a half years left to retire with a full pension. So it's like I didn't want to be a part of the narrative that we were creating every Friday when we talked about who had the worst week. I no longer wanted to drink my life away and be numb, you know, and eat fried foods to 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 talk about how much I hate my life and I hate my job and I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm no longer going to go to Paris for seven days and, and spend the first three days talking about my job. The one day I might enjoy Paris and then the three, three days later, you know, having heart palpitations because I'm, I'm anticipating. Work, right? So we have made our jobs our everything. And so part of it is, um, and we've created a narrative with our friends and a whole life that, that, fosters in our dysfunction. And once you choose to do different, you have to be willing for all hell to break loose because you now have to run for your life. I, I love that because so much, you know, your friends can either feed you, motivate you. Your circle is, you're in that midst and everybody's like. But you're yeah. creating it too. You can't be like, your school ain't in there. Your school yeah. ain't in there. You like, men ain't. <laughs> Yeah. My, my job is X. <laughs> I hate these people, these people. And then they like, I hate these people too. Tim, let me tell you about mine. And just kind of where you are with that. And once you change the conversation, you can change the whole circle. So some people might pick up on that energy and say, you know what? Okay, I hated those people, but maybe there was one positive. Or I tried this this week and this actually made my week better. So opposed to kind of sharing those successes and you can change the trajectory of the conversation, even with your friends. Yeah. One, uh, I just interviewed one of my clients on Friday. She said she heard her friends were talking and they started, they got negative and she was like, hold up. Why don't we focus on what the possibilities are? Uh, let's stop focusing on how it's going to fail, or how it's not going to work. Let's now, she shifted the conversation like that. And this is the thing. That friend was willing to shift with her. A lot of people aren't willing to shift, so those are the people that you're gonna have to leave alone. And one, one of my clients that I talked to, she's complaining. I cussed her out on the call. On the call, I was, you know, a little crazy. 
But I was like, who, like, she had so much passion and fire behind her complaining and her justification of where she was. I let her have it. I said, who are your friends to let you passionately, like, she gave me a headache complaining, like, passionately about how everybody was doing her wrong. So now she's free. We didn't work. She's free. They go to brunch. She was looking like, my God, everybody was complaining because she used to be part of that narrative. And so instead of leaving, she got drunk on mimosas. And I was like, you know, you you were part of that conversation. One, you can't judge people on what you just got out of. Does that make sense? Like, they're reflecting, you, you just got out of this thing three months like, ago. Now I'm betting y'all. <laughs> yeah, now you, you know, but the problem is, instead of leaving, you chose to numb yourself to a to the pain in a conversation that you no longer belong in because you've shifted your whole life and you're actually happy. So you, she had nothing to complain about. But she she surrounded herself around people who complained because she used to be that person. So now it's like, are you going to, you can't stay there anymore once you're free. And, and the thing about it, Rosalind, is that we don't know that we can be free. And I'm here to tell you that you can. That's the whole goal of anything we talk about is I want women to know that you don't have to work three times as hard to make 50% of the pay. You can actually get paid three times as more work at 50% less, right? You know, you don't have to 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 burn yourself out and and do 100 things to get promoted. You only really need to do one. You don't have to be sick when you go to work. You don't have to take medical leave. Like, this becomes a new conversation of, of when they say that I'm burning out. And I'm like, no, you don't burn out. It's catastrophic. Like, y'all just, y'all might be smoking, but y'all ain't burning out, right? Like, we're creating this whole narrative around our limitations as opposed to saying, you know, um, one of my clients was like, I made 165. And I was like, when you're complaining about it, it's three women I know they make a million dollars. Why are you not making a million dollars? So we don't have people who are challenging us to say you should be making two, three times as much. They're they're soothing us in our complaining that we're not making enough as opposed to pushing us to go, you know, make more money. And a lot of people are sitting there and they're like, I hate my job. I ain't making enough money. And then what do we do as black women? We are the number one new business owner. So we are starting businesses at higher rates than anyone else. But unfortunately, we're making less, sometimes less than what we were making in corporate America with less benefits and all those kind of things. So for those women that are saying, I hate my job, I'm going to quit, I'm going to go do this on my own. And then they still not successful. <laughs> what? And, and success can be measured in a number of different ways, but it definitely if you make it less and working more, that ain't it. I did that. I, every, everything that we talk about today and all the all the harsh criticism that I had, I did all of it. You mean like I did it? I did, I did paid all the dues, baby. I got the <laughs> stamps on my back to prove it. I got the passport stamps on my. You better not quit that 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 good job for entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship, you know, like well, I want to be free. I'm gonna be an entrepreneur. Do you not understand? You work 24 hours a day as an entrepreneur. You don't make any money for like the first two years. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and I think the bigger danger of entrepreneurship was nobody told me because I ran right out there in the streets like Tina turned around from Ike, Ike and that white suit, baby, talking about, oh, I'm going to kill it. I'm Christy Rutherford. I put my hands on anything. It's going to work. Well, it worked when I, because I'm the leader of my organization. I'm an executive leader. I got a team of 160 people and I had to start doing it. I was like, wait, I got to do that? <laughs> that was the shocker. Um, but the biggest thing was it takes 120% brain capacity to successfully launch a business that you still not going to get paid for in the first two years. And we're leaving with 10%. I had 10% brain capacity. I was burning out. I was crazy. I was stressed out. I've been working for 15, you know, 15, 16 years. I had nothing to give to a business. I had 10% mental health on fleek. I don't know if people saying fleek now, still saying fleek, right? <laughs> But I had 10% brain capacity and, um, you know, analogy that I use is if you take a, a Coke can that's that's sealed and you put a brick on that Coke can, what do you think it happened, Rosa? It's just going to sit there. It's going to sit there, right? But if you open that Coke can and pour it out and you put that brick on that Coke can, what's going to happen? It's going to crush it. Smash. So... Uh, a healthy, hold, and heal woman represents the sealed cocaine. You can put a brick on top of that. I can put a brick on. Like, you know, our business is is doing what it's doing. It's amazing. Um, but I'm whole now. But it, but but I got crushed first because I got out. I was empty. I had nothing. I'm tired. I'm depleted. I have these friends that are 
that are holding me hostage to a job or, or to a reality that I don't want. I have family members who are supporting me, you know, in my complaining or watching me burn out and not going to say anything about it. And I came out smash. And when I went smash, now all everything falls apart because I never, what goes smash is our, the last 10% goes to zero. And then, and then we're right down and we're done. And then we lose the money that we save. And, and we're such targets of easily, and I wouldn't even call them predators. We're the biggest suckers in these streets because we're desperate and we're arrogant and we're egotistical. And we think that we're going to kill it because we think that everything that we did in our job transfers over into entrepreneurship. Um, and it doesn't necessarily work that way. And so we get taken advantage of a lot because we have a lot of money and we think we know everything. So we throw our money at everything saying we're going to kill it and ain't killing nothing. Um, so I recommend that you work on yourself first, work on understanding who you are first, work on your habits first, work on cleaning up your detrimental conversations with yourself first, work on having, you know, real honest, reflection in the mirror at how you're creating your misery first work on actually acknowledging how bad is crazy you are first and fixing that stuff first and fixing your physical health first then um you know you can double and triple your salary and then work yourself out of a job i'm not for the struggle i lost my money three and a half years in my brother's house with zero dollars i'm the 13th african woman African American woman to make commander in the Coast Guard US. I had an MBA and I had a co- coaching certification and I went to culinary school and you know I'm the first six figure earner in my family. I'm the first, you know, fam- one of the first people in my family to graduate from college. I'm the first person in my family to get a master's degree. I remember my brother's house uh, with absolutely no money for three and a half years because I could not coherently get my itch together to be able to help myself. How am I going to build a business to help other people when I am dust? <laughs> dust. You hear me? <laughs> see, and that, you know, that, yeah, people aren't, sisters ain't telling that story that, and I see them in the background. They go, like, I quit my job and I ain't making no money. And da, 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 da. Well, you did that. You made that decision. But, and we're chasing the money browser. We're not chasing our mental health. I love that. And we don't even know what it is to be healthy sometimes. Like we've never <laughs> from day one, we like, I'm jumping in here. I'm going to do everything. I'm doing 10 things at home and 20 things at work. And we've never experienced. We've never experienced uh, healing and wholeness. And so part of, um, you know, Jennifer's story, y'all had Jennifer on, what did you say, four weeks ago. Um, you know, Jennifer single. Jennifer, Jennifer had, had created this narrative she wrote her book, so I ain't telling her business. It's in her book, right? So good. Release pressure. Jennifer had created this narrative around, you know, having endometriosis and, and fibroids and, um, you know, high blood pressure. And, and she and she had a speech impediment. She stuttered for, since she was three. And she built a whole ecosystem around that story that would support why she should do that. Every woman in her family had a hysterectomy. Um, her mama, her grandmama, her cousins, her grand, you know, like her aunts, like all these women. So she, so there was this narrative already created for her to now walk in because this is expected to happen for us. And I said, that's a lie. Now Jennifer doesn't have fibroids. She doesn't have endometriosis. She don't have high blood pressure. No more. Jennifer don't stutter no more, which was more shocking. I didn't say you ain't gonna stutter after nine days. All of that was rooted in stress, but it's not, you know, a part of it was rooted in stress. But it was also rooted in the narrative that was created that this is normal for you and and her accepting it, her accepting the the diagnosis of onset high blood pressure. Her her doctor couldn't explain what a high blood pressure was coming from when it was coming from the stress that she was not willing to own or manage. She didn't know how stressed out she was until I was like, "Uh uh-uh, ain't no way. Ain't no way you gonna walk around with all that baggage and tell me that you know. I say this and I'm, I'm, you know, I cussed out too, but still cussed to be like, oh, like, there's no way. It's just impossible. And, but this is the thing, Rosalind. We have to be willing to talk to people who would challenge our BS. So somebody, because everybody, a lot of women don't like that when I tell them. I'll be like this. You know you can be better. You know, you know you can actually have a different life. You know you can triple your salary. 
Women get angry when I tell them that they can actually be happy because they don't want to believe it because they have settled into the cement of misery and I'm going to die like this and, and anybody who meets me is going to have to love me with my mental health challenges and there, people are going to have to accept me like this and, and, and what a terrible way to live. Mm. I hate that. I hate, I hate that we are there, but it's, it's so true. Talking about we got high, high, what do they call it? High functioning anxiety and high functioning depression. That is it. That's a medical condition created by marketers to be able to sell drugs. But go ahead and listen. I'm sorry. Put this up on you. But basically, they're just saying, hey, you can do it, work through it, push through. And how many times we say that? Push through. And you're not solving it. Yeah, you're not. High, saying you're a high-functioning depression and high-functioning anxiety says that I know that I am I am a workaholic. And instead of me learning how to take care of myself and stop working as hard and stop buying a BS narrative that they have sold me and that I've sold myself and that now the drug companies have sold me in order to medicate me. I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to work 40 hours a week. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to, I'm going to go after my destiny, and I'm not going to suppress it anymore because depression is destiny suppression. I'm going to stop being bored and content with the life where I'm working so far beneath my value that I can just freaking sleepwalk through life. I'm actually going to take a risk and go be happy and do what makes my heart content. Um, that's free. Mm. Now. You were with us last year and Jennifer saw you last year and Jennifer said, you know what? I want to be a part of your master class. What was in store for her? What was next? And so somebody's watching this today and they're like, okay, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I don't feel like I'm toxic, but I ain't making what I want to make. Or I've been thinking about going to get that next master's degree, but maybe I should talk to somebody first. What do you say to that person that's watching. And then if they say, maybe I want to be involved. So they're like, maybe I'm sticking my toe in. What can they expect and how can they do that? Uh, uh, I don't do toe, toe dippers. <laughs> one. Uh, two, you know, either you want it or you don't. You know, and it's not necessarily the job, Rosalind. Who gives an SHIT about your job? Jennifer was sick. Why? Would, that's why. That's when I cussed out. Why are we talking about your job when you got full medical conditions? <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, what are you talking about? Like, you're, you're, she's like 33. This is last year. So she was 30. You're a baby and you're walking around sicker than my 80 year old uncle. Why are we talking about your job? So it's not about the job, but we want our money too. Because two weeks after she started, she got a fourteen thousand dollars raise. Let's just be clear. So it's not necessarily, you know, oh, if I, if I, oh, you know, I think I want to be their friend. I'm not really sure. We don't work with women like that. Does that make sense? It's like, do you want it or do you do you not? Do you believe? Can we touch and agree? Can two people touch a two or more people touch and agree on this earth on something that your life can be better? That your life can be different, that you deserve to be different, that you can be different, that you can have a better quality of life, that you can have it all. Can we touch and agree on that? Oh, yes, great. Okay, well, let's talk then. Let's 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 let's, let's be about it, right? So even though we talk about uh the money, yeah, we got $10 million in raises. I'm not really impressed with the raise. I'm more impressed with what we don't talk about, but women don't want to hear about it. We've saved 20 marriages. I know we've kept 50 kids out of therapy talking about their mama. Who uh who is toxic and coming in the house not paying attention to them? You know we've gotten fifteen women off of off of uh, medications that they've been on and heal the heal the conditions that were all rooted in stress. Um, you know so yeah, it's about the money. We want our money too, but why are we talking about money when we're so freaking miserable? And now we've ex adopted this thing of oh, we need to these things mental health like we walk around with these mental health problems and these diagnoses is that we're now proud to say i'm a high functioning anxiety you're like wait what like you're wearing that as a badge of honor why are we talking about your job but we don't get that job though but i want to talk about what the real problem is and why sisters are not giving themselves permissions to live the better quality of life why you're not giving yourself permission to be as passionate as I am about what I'm doing right now because this is my calling because it damn near died trying to figure it out. And now I come back to share this. But there's something that you're passionate about. Jennifer now can go to say 
to the 80%, they say 80% of black women before we turn 50 can have, or are going to have fibroids, you're going to say, no, no, that's been reversed now. Let me show you that that has been done for me, right? So what has God called you to do? Why are you here to, to, we're not here to be in a job. We're here to solve a problem for our generation. So let's get into alignment with your destiny. Now we're going to use that job because I like their money. I'm not for the struggle. I did the struggle already. I'm not for it. I want to 2X or 3X your salary. Use their money to work yourself out of the job. That's the plan. So if you want to do that, get on my phone. But you're trying to dip a toe in. We ain't talking. I ain't got nothing for toe dippers. You know, it's like we... Six people got killed yesterday at the 4th of July parade. 30 people got shot, right? Like, people, my, my, one of my BFFFFs died suddenly. He was 50, December 28. Did not find him until January 3rd. They was like, what, what is doing that? He was going to launch the men's arm of my business in January. He died, gone, poof, just like that. So for us to think that, we had the next 20 years to be miserable, or we had the next five years to be miserable. How how dare we, and I did it, does that make sense? How dare we blow the best times and the best part of our lives in our 40s, you know, waiting to become 65, 70 so we can retire. We're too old to do something right now. Why can't we, why can't we rest in peace now? Why can't we have peace while we on, on earth? Why can't we find the kingdom of heaven? Why are we here? The kingdom of heaven is here. Right? Why Why we got to die to have peace? And I want to go to my color purple. It'll be like this. Um, <laughs> this might be over soon. Heaven lasts always. <laughs> what? Like, hey, no, we ain't waiting on that. And, and I think that's the thing is that we, we have become so program to just dress up our crazy and our brokenness and, and to smile on social media to go get these you know you go to freaking greece and get the what the the the, the long dress the, the flowing dress you pay five thousand dollars for that but you ain't got no money for coaching so you got five thousand dollars to take two shots to impress everybody on social media but you can't but you can't afford to be able to invest in yourself and i think you know the, the the other conversation is why don't we think that we're valuable? Why why don't we think that we're worth investing in? We we get all these degrees to study everything but ourselves. We get all these degrees to look at everybody but ourselves. We we join these we take these classes and we study everything but ourselves. Everything that you need and everything that you want is within you. Your purpose you ain't got to look for your purpose. Your purpose is within you. You don't have to look for your destiny. Your destiny is within you. Purpose is not found. Purpose is revealed. So many of us we need, we need to know that it's revealed, so it's already in you. It's not growing. You're not gonna go get another degree. You're not gonna get another certificate. Somebody's not gonna be able to train it. I mean, it's already there. It's just getting all this other stuff out the way. So they be in your purpose. Mm -hmm. Our point <laughs> is for someone else. To say their story, so a year from now, somebody gonna say, "Hey, I called Christy. I I sent that text message. I I I've invested in myself, and then I want to be at your launch party, like I was at Jennifer's on Saturday. I want to buy your book because it's on the shelf. It's on my to read, yeah. <laughs> read list, yeah. and I got, I got a stack of books. So if y'all follow, y'all know I'm reading all the time. So I'm like, okay, that's next." And so I want to celebrate that with you. And so I hope you all, you know, if you're here, I'm 100% celebrating. I'm 100% here to encourage. And we talked about so many different things. And it's like sometimes we're just chasing the money. But in that chase, we haven't we haven't put nutrients in our soul. So if we run in that race, we're going to pass out on the race. I passed out. I passed out. Uh, oh, oh no, you know, you come around that corner at that 300, that 300 mark, and you sprint at that last 100, I collapse that and drag me off the field. So, um, you're doing it daily. we going to go to work tomorrow. Somebody going to be like, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> you sitting in the parking lot, like, <sighs> I, used to, I used to drive by my office and wish that the building would collapse. Just burn down. Just well, you know, I heard, though, but I wanted that building to be gone. I would just, I would just, I would just keep on driving. And they gonna be like, it's okay, you can work from home today. <laughs> I just keep on driving. Be like this. I hope I come back. That building gone. Come back. You be like this. I just, I hate my whole life. And we deserve. 
I deserve better than that. And 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 the women who are watching and listening, y'all deserve better than that too. Like y'all deserve to, you know, as, as I keep looking outside, I live on the beach in the Bahamas, right? So I keep when I'm looking outside, I'm looking at a jet ski go by, I'm looking at a cruise ship or a yacht pass by. So it's like we deserve to have that life where, you know, I got I got all my hair back. I don't have any medical conditions. I left my career with 17 medical conditions. I don't have any. You know, I do what I love. I do what I'm passionate about. And yeah, it took me a while to get into alignment because I didn't want to tell my story. But how I wanted to be the voice to women to, to come in and create a new narrative of what's possible for us. But I also wanted to talk to high team women because we're a lot of the women like what you're talking about. We're not having these conversations enough in the open. And we don't have anybody who is a representation of what healthy change looks like to be able to say that we can be different. Like we, we only just see the raggedy people who just telling us to endure. <laughs> Yeah, the really happy woman who comes on talking all kind of trash and be like, no, you have it, right? They're like, what? Um, but you know, you have to choose whether or not you you believe or that you want it to be true for you. Um, and I think that's the bigger problem is that we don't believe that it's true for us and we deserve it. Now, if someone wants to jump on board, how do they get started? Okay. Uh, you can text level up L E V E L U P to six six eight six six, and then you can um, you register for our event on Saturday. So we have an event on Saturday from nine to twelve. Uh, I do events now, um, and then I'll talk about you know how to calculate your value in the market, and then at the end I'll tell tell you how you can work with me and my team. We would love, and I mean all caps L O B E to assist you with living your best life. This is what we do, right? And I get loud and I get excited because, um, you know, the transformation for us is, and, and the lifestyle and the quality of life, and then the joy that my clients experience is, is unmatched. We want our money too, though. So we're going to get that money, $10 million in raises in a pandemic. This is June 2020, right? So that's two years ago. But uh, but level up with Christy C H R I S T Y dot com or you can text six six or you can text level up to six six eight six six and then join us on Saturday and I would love to uh, to assist you with getting to the next level that you deserve and desire and deserve. Thank you, Rosalind. You're amazing. Thank you. You are amazing. Love to be surrounded by more amazing Black women, and I think it's gonna be more and more amazing black women that we're going to be able to celebrate because somebody watching this today is going to be way different months from now because of what they did today and one of the great things christy talking about getting some more money but one thing you might not realize because if you over there making 40 50 60 000 you probably have never experienced restricted stock stock options some of those fancier ways that you don't get stock options at thirty thousand dollars like what kind of people you got in your group? Who are you talking about? You're talking about you making 30000 you got an MBA. So like we we going to talk about that next right. week. So I hope y'all going to be here next I'll be week. Because next, week. Be <laughs> next week, when you getting more money, you need to know, okay, what's the other ways I can get more money? So I'm going to be able to negotiate things more than just the salary. So you need to be able to focus bigger than just the salary. But big money. Big money ain't just this is your this is your salary when you when you get to be C suite, they not yeah. just that you can stuff before C suite too. You can get a severance package, or you can get a you know we have clients who getting you know uh, a hundred and forty thousand dollars sign on bonus, you know uh, a fifty thousand dollars sign on bonus, thirty thousand dollars in back pay, fifteen thousand dollars. Like some women are being bought out of their their bonuses that they would have got for this one job. They negotiated like if when you come in and you're happy, the way to distinguish yourself from other your competition in this in this season right here, in this season of hell and, 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 and chaos, <laughs> the way to distinguish yourself above your peers and anybody that's actually have peace and be happy. Maybe like this. Why is this lady so freaking happy? They want it because everybody is miserable and everybody is hanging on by a thread and everybody is that is crazy right now. So um, if you if you come in and you have your peace and you have your joy and you know who you are, they will they will I mean fly fling open the door for you, fling it open. Can I say one more story? No, no, they're not. They're not. <laughs> yes. 
So the 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 lady that I was saying that would chase people down the hallway that was nasty, I think she started to think it was, I mean, it's just insane. And so she ended up having an interview the other day with um with some people at on a Monday at five o'clock, and they and they called her at nine o'clock. The HR manager called her at nine o'clock that night and was like, "Look, uh, this is the first interview. She's supposed to go through four rounds of interviews, you know, like the normal process, and they got to interview all these people." <laughs> <laughs> had so much joy and so much peace. They call her. They interview her on five thirty. At five thirty, she was done at six thirty. They call her at nine. They said, "We want you right now. We will make an offer right now." Man. Never done this before. The HR man said, "Sorry to call you. It was late at night. We want to make you the offer." So it's like people want senior. People want sisters on their team. People don't want angry, bitter, justifiably angry. Does that make sense? Um tired, resentful, side-eye, passive-aggressive, passive or aggressive or passive-aggressive. People don't want that, so we've lost ourselves. Um, you know, even before 2020 rolled around and put everybody in the chokehold, we was burning up, you know, burning up on fire for the past 15 years. So, but yeah, they called that night. So that's how it happens. It's like, that's how you set yourself apart. They were like, everybody, like, they was like, hire this chick right now. We ain't gotta talk to nobody else. We didn't talk to enough dead people around here to know that we like her and she's qualified. So um that's all I got. But it's what's possible. And I, I think we don't think that it's possible yet. So there are some there's somebody out there that's like, mm, that was nice. Maybe it's not for me. That's what she said. She didn't believe me. She was like, Chris, you always say that your clients and she a client. She when I say skeptical, that was her. Like anything I said, she was like, I'll believe it. But she did the work though. That's the difference. She, she was still there. You be like, that's fine. You can prove me right all day. So she was like, Chris, you remember when you said that your clients don't apply for jobs, people come to them? Well, I thought you were lying, but let me tell you what happened. I'd be like, this will keep proving me right because we need people, Rosalind, to be able to become the truth uh, because we've been listening to lies long enough from ourselves and from other people. So somebody got to come in here and change the narrative because we can't all. We can't keep getting these degrees and keep being the most educated and least paid, right? We can't keep touting that, oh, I got my master's degree. We got all these sisters, you know, taking these pictures and getting their PhDs and they ain't making no money. You be like, I'm not, I'm not clapping for that PhD until you take you make four hundred thousand dollars. You know, why'd you get a PhD to make eighty five thousand dollars? That's crazy. So, anyway, they got the money. <laughs> they got the money. They pay definitely. And so, I hope somebody. It's going to take advantage of the opportunity. Oh, they can follow me on Instagram. They can follow me on Instagram. Give my stuff. That's, that's at no cost. I'm cool with that. And, and sign up for the newsletter, too, because she sent a ton of emails. So definitely sign up. Get Even if you want to get the free until you want to pay, hey, get free. And then you pay. Um, but invest in yourself. So that's going to be investing with your time, your money, your energy, your mm -hmm. mindset. And just believing what is possible. Yeah, yeah. And if if somebody around you and they don't believe what's possible and they don't see greatness in you, distance. Well, it's not. It's not. It's not other people. The reason why you you tolerate people not seeing greatness in you is because you don't see what's great in you. It's not about other people. It's not about being raggedy friends when you raggedy. <laughs> and a lot of us, I'm saying, hey, I used to be real raggedy. Yeah, I, I used to spend a lot of time at the happy hour. Yeah, they yeah. these people yeah. this week. <laughs> Let me tell you what they did this week. And so, don't let this week be the same as last week. So we're investing in ourselves in a number of different ways. And so I want you to invest in your future, and whatever you think you can do, push it. Mm -hmm. So if you're like, I'm just trying to hit six figures. No. Yeah. Not enough. Push it. Go further. There are black women out there doing more and they are going further. And so this is meant for you as well. And so I want to thank you, Christy, for being with us. I don't know who who we going to be celebrating next time, but I already know I'm speaking it is out there. So a few months from now, yeah. we'll be celebrating somebody, somebody yeah. will reach out to you and they're going to be doing their thing. And I can't wait to celebrate whoever that person is in just a few months. Bye, y'all. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>